and I didn't know why we were going. And uh, he came to town by himself, never before. So I thought I was upset with me and his father. He was, <laughs> oh, I didn't know if I should say that. He was really upset because <laughs> he was spending too much money for gifts, and they were kind of looking out for him. I think he appreciated that, but when, when the colonel got involved, that's what he did. So anyway, uh, he asked me to meet him at the airport, and I'll make this short. Uh, I meet him, and I'm, I'm working at uh, Paramount Studios, and he said, we spent the night, next night he said, I need you to go to Washington. Uh, Elvis has never traveled by himself before. Uh, he didn't carry money. I didn't have any money. <laughs> so, and it was a Sunday night, and we had his credit card. And the, the driver found a place to check, cashed a $500 check. And they pre boarded us for an all night flight to Washington, and that's all we had. And I'm going to Washington with Elvis Presley. And soldiers are getting on the plane from Vietnam at that time. And he started talking to one of them and came back and goes, where's that money? And I said, Elvis, that's all we got. He said, you don't understand. He's going home to see his family. He gave him the whole $500. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just one story. That he, this is the heart that he had. You know, he was a soldier. He was uh, fighting for our country. And he felt that, you know, no one they don't make you know, very much and they're giving to their lives. This is, this is what he had in, in him. And I, and I remember also, about, of course, everyone knows the car story that he gave away cars, and that's the honest to God truth. He would. He wanted people to have the opportunity to have things that they could never afford and always related it to his humble beginnings and uh, how they always looked at, you know, of giving back. And he gave back silently, truly. He did not, and there's loads and loads of stories just like this that would really take up a lot of time. And when I said he was upset with me, I'm going to clarify that. It was because um, when he went to Washington, his father came to me and he said, oh my gosh, you know, he's just spending so much and we've got, you know, we got to watch him. He's got to, you know, he's, he's got to, you know, he can't ask me to, to, uh, to keep touring. And he said, can you help me out? And so we went to him and he said, you know, this is between him and his father more than me. I was just in support. Come on, son, you gotta watch it, this and that. And Elvis hated it when someone told him he couldn't do something. In fact, if you told him he couldn't do something, he would go out of his way to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he had a mind of his own. Priscilla, uh, uh, just because now we're on the topic, there's something we prepared for you. So, um, I, there's an award we're going to give to you tonight because uh, of all the good things Elvis and the Elvis family did to help and support people. We want to give you the Mission Hope Award. That's a charity organization that's helping small kids that have problems, like or uh, if they need something special, devices or some therapies that are not paid for. So that's just so you know what the award is from. So I want to uh, get two of my friends on stage. One of them is Maria, and she's, uh, I don't really see her, sorry. Ah, there we are. So I want, want everybody to welcome Maria Gamos. Maria is the president of the Elvis Presley Gesellschaft in Germany, and Gernot is the president of Mission Hoffnung, which is like means like Mission Hope to give hope to children and families. So, please give a big hand of applause. charity that you and Elvis did and does for everybody and this is the Mission Hope Award. Thank you so much.
really from the bottom of my heart. This is what means a lot to me. And um, we try, my daughter and I and our family, you know, to carry on this tradition where all, all of us are involved with special char char uh, charities. And um, really an honor, although we all are compassionate, I have to say that Filmy is very loving and really an honor of Elvis, and of course Lisa with her father, we want to carry this out and, and um, kind of, you know, with his, and keep his legacy going. So thank you so much.
Yes, it was a very vulnerable time. Um, as we all know, his mother had passed away a year before. And for some reason, he just, as for a 14 year old, poured his heart out to me. And I was a good listener, and I still think I'm a good listener. And I listen to people and, and try to be them, try to feel what they feel. And others noticed that about me, that, that I had a lot of compassion, and I was there for him. And he would call me back and have him, you know, have someone pick me up and bring me to his home. And it seemed like that's all he did. He gushed. He he confided in me things that I would never reveal because he trusted me that much. So I honor that and um, still honor that. But I feel very fortunate that I was there for him at that time. It's what he needed. So. You were talking about horses, and I know you have a big passion for animals. So what we also wonder is, um, like, what happened to the horses in Graceland after Elvis passed? And do you still have horses or still riding? Well, I don't ride much anymore. The horses at Graceland, the, 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 the answer to your question is yes, there are still horses at Graceland. The horses that... Um, that were at Graceland, the time of uh, his passing, continue to leave at Graceland and live very long lives. Uh, they were pampered, cared for. Uh, we had a, still have an amazing woman who's still there, um, 80, everyone knows her as 80. Uh, she um, takes care of their horses like their show horses, and they should be, and rightfully so, because of, uh, of Elvis and, and his care of horses. I'll never forget, um, people wanted to know what his hobby was, and when he got involved with a hobby, he went full forth in it. And uh, he used to go out, and this was another time that we would do pound talks, very early in the morning, like 2 o'clock, or after we'd come home from a movie, we would walk out to the barn. And it was fun, because it was like two little kids getting away with nobody around, they were always sleeping, and we'd get up and go out to, into the back uh, area where the barn was, and he would pet them, he would talk to them. It was therapy for him in many ways. And in fact, uh, he would be excited about putting remember, names on all the stables, and he would move the, the reins around, you know, and all the, all the uh, hooks and whose horse reins were going where. And, and he was even painting, and he got really, really in, involved with it. And, um, and that was a, a really fun, fun, fun time for all of us. Before Priscilla, that barn was never used. It was not painted. It just sat back there. Nobody even knew it was there. And he decided to get a horse for Christmas for you. And that the barn, and he loved it. It came alive. <laughs> and, and it's still alive. And it's still alive today, and we're very proud of it. Um, and people from all over just come to take a look at them. We'll always have a golden palomino there. Thank you. And um, fun. And uh, to keep that legacy, and always a black horse as well, because those are the, the two horses that um, we're very fond of. Yeah. Wow. So, how about vacation? Because everybody's thinking that, or would think that Elvis had like all. He could go wherever, but he never actually took a vacation outside of the United States or Europe. Why is that? Well, it, it, it was a difficult thing for him to do, to just go to a strange place and um, just pop up. I mean, you know, there was a lot, a lot that went through going on vacation. Um, security, or especially if he was touring, that he would, they would have to, and it would be a, it would really be a vacation touring-wise. But just even going out, he'd make sure that the guys that he wanted to be with him knew what to do. Is say, they what we'll call bodyguards, but Jerry knows that. Made sure security was good. Made sure that there was someone there to meet us. We had our own driver that was there to pick us up, and so. You know, he couldn't just go walking around. And usually the places that we stayed at, like the private beach in Hawaii, we would take uh, private residences, or we would take the suites of hotels, and there'd be security there. 
And it's hard for people go, you know, can you see one person walking down the street? It was hard to do that. It was hard for him to enjoy because he was always very cautious and looking around to see, you know, if one person would come up and, and have an autograph. He knew that that opened it up for everybody to have an autograph. And he was very fast paced. And he taught me a lot about how to, to, and I'm sure with you as well, you know, when we're out in public, um, that you move in with a mission, what we have to do, because it would cause such a commotion that really his life was disrupted. He couldn't really fulfill what he wanted to do, or, you know, the places that he had that he wanted to be. So, um, uh, in fact, after our wedding, we were going to one of the ones we really wanted to do was go to Europe and visit, but again, on vacation. And um, this is when we went to Hawaii. We had our passports done in Hawaii. I think you had yours done here in the States when you were called up. Yeah. And um, Colonel had heard about it, right? And he, he kind of put a stop to it. And his thing was security, security, security. So we ended up going to the Bahamas at that time. And actually had a good time. It rained a lot. It rained. We ate a lot. We, we gained a lot of weight. <laughs> That's true. But I um, used to do a lot of what do you call it? Uh, skiing and a jet mobile. Yeah. yeah. Did a lot of that and had a lot, a lot of fun. We did have fun when we go out uh, on our vacations. And Hawaii, of course, is one of his favorites because you could really go unnoticed there. He was. They just Hawaiian people are very, uh, very gracious and respectful. very respectful. Yeah. So he felt very, very comfortable there, and that his life wouldn't be interrupted. Yeah. But in the place that we did go also skiing, we would go up to um, um, Aspen, Vail, Snowmass, and we went there a lot. And he felt very comfortable because he could wear a ski mask. No one would ever know who he was, and now he could have fun all this, uh, all this, all this way, you know, and that's uh, throwing snowballs at everybody and, and uh, the racing and the snowmobiles. So we, when we had them. Skied at night time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We <laughs> skied at night. So nocturnal. You see a lot of lights coming down on the mountains, it would be awesome, or whatever. No, so he liked doing things like that. He was free and liberated uh, when he was able to to have fun with the people that that, that he loved being with. So it was, we had great, we did have great times. Yeah. I can imagine. Maybe you're ready for one more question from the audience, Mr. Commissioner. Um, I, yeah, we have a question, a personal one. Uh, Priscilla, please talk about the moment when uh, Elvis told you, um, no, when you told Elvis, sorry, um, that he will be your father. Where was this and how was his reaction? Well, this is in Memphis and I, you know, I, I, I wasn't feeling right physically. I felt something, you know, was array, I guess you'd say. And I went to the doctor. Um, I actually asked um, around about a good doctor that I could go to. And um, I had a checkup and found out that I was pregnant. And um, I got home to Graceland. And I said, um, you know, that we're going to have a baby. And he, well, he knew we were going to have a baby, obviously, because I told him I felt, you know, very strange. And he had called his daddy up, and his dad was going to cross the hill. I'll never, I'll never forget this. He came into the garage area, and he said, Daddy, he says, you're going you're gonna to be a, you're a, you're, you're a gray-haired granddaddy. You're going to be a gray-haired granddaddy. And that's what he told his father, because he was so excited. And, um, you know, I think that... That was the first time I think he realized, wow, he's an adult. <laughs> I'm having a baby, you know. So he was, he was, he was really thrilled. He was thrilled. He's a good daddy. Yeah. I got the honor of driving you guys to the hospital. Yeah. Which yeah. when Lisa was born. <laughs> yeah. We're just about to go to the wrong hospital, actually. So uh, I drove to the wrong hospital. <laughs> Where are you going? I know. Uh, they changed plans and were keeping it a secret. And they kept it a secret from me. It was driving. Everybody, everybody, thank you. 
about the other person that told him. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they made it. Oh, yeah, slow motion day. I was waiting by the door with my legs like this, you know, with my hand propped against the, the door. And I was just getting this. He's getting cigars. He's getting his hat. He's getting everything. And I'm like, what's taking you so long? <laughs> we in the kitchen, and I remember. And Elvis is being so calm because he was so nervous. And he was saying, you know, don't get it, you know, don't get excited, Jerry. You're just good. And I hear somebody, Elvis, uh, Priscilla's at the car waiting for us while we're being calm. <laughs> he forgot about me. <laughs> oh my God, he was in the day. <laughs> I think we all were actually. Maria, do you have one more question from the audience? There's a lot about Elvis for now, but um, there's a question concerning you personally, and it's about your maiden name. And it's from French heritage. And um, when the, um, the person that asked the question once visited Scotland, there was a place called Beaulieu as well. And um, he wants, or she wants to know if you, if you do know anything about the roots of your family. Um, yes, one second. Is a gentleman behind you with us? Is he? Right behind Maria, who's flashing the camera. Are you with us, or are you just taking pictures? Is he? Oh, okay, good. He's, he's okay? Okay. I just keep seeing the light flashing going back and forth. I'm just distracted. Sorry about that. Because it's hard to see just the light. Okay. Was the question? No. Um, you know, um, I know that uh, we have relatives in, uh, in Canada and, um, and in, in France. It's scattered. And I also know that, that the name is, is a, it's not a common name, but it's a known name, of course, is for your wine. And I know, too, that people pronounce it very differently in America. Um, it's a little trivial thing. We've been calling everything from Beaulieu to Bowler to Beaulieu. And my father gets very upset because no one knows really how to pronounce the name. And just for your information, it's Beaulieu. <laughs> and it's a little French accent, too. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm on contact. I, I mean, there are some relatives that I know that they are there. But I, when every time I go to Canada, they um, they want to know if I've met any of my relatives, and I honestly haven't because it's been scattered all over. But that's all I know. Yeah. Would this be a good time for the uh, little insider announcement that you mentioned at the beginning of the event? Yes, I think so. So, um, Jerry and I are executive producers on the HBO special, actually, our four hour. A four-hour special. Um, um, it's a music miniseries. It hasn't been really titled yet. We're kind of one by Man Behind the Music, just as a working title. And it's going to be, I think, quite unique and very special in that um, we have a wonderful director with Tom, Tom, Tom Zemi. Yeah. And uh, he's doing a lot of good research. and. It's of all the people who we still have with us today, that very, very close to us, that really takes us behind the scenes and stories that really you've never heard of because he doesn't want the same old stories that, not that they're old, but things that have been said many times before. We'll get a, lot, a whole new look in different ways of their take on him, working with him, and how involved he was with his music in areas that you know, some people talk about they weren't really there and just heard that, yes, you know, what means uh, that he had um, as far as how he prepared, let's say, for music and, and how he, why a certain song resonated to him. Yes, it has a lot to do with his background, but it had to do with a lot of connections and, and how he would, he felt that human, uh, a human emotion, <coughs> He, he loved stories. He loved a song with a great story. And one, actually, one of these are my favorite. I know it's very dark, 
and a lot of people would prefer the upbeat and pop, but only because it's quite personal in that, I think it was Cliff Lee's who brought that song to him. The one that's the museum. Yeah. That's a great It's a great song. I think that's from the O R and D. Yeah. 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 Y
and they were all saying that it was such an honor working on this in the songs and how they all came to life. And I said, this is really what he wanted on his album. Exactly what you hear it is what he wanted. And and it's a long struggle we'll go into how it was a struggle. Three million copies later. Yeah, I think it's, it's a triple platinum. And it's just, it went triple platinum in four months. He actually was number one, and Adele then released her album and uh, became number one, and he took second place. And that's okay, it's a girl. We're all right with that. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and then uh, One Direction also came in, and he beat One Direction. Rod Stewart, Rod Stewart. It was unbelievable. Every day we would watch the charts and see where he was, where he was, and we're all freaking out, emails going all over the place, and he's still number one, now he's number two, hanging in a number two, going to three, but back to number two. So he was wiping everybody out, and this happened like in four months, and it's going and going, and it still has shelf life. It still has shelf life, so. Um, and it took off in Europe. Thank you, guys. Yes, yeah, it took off in Europe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. But it's heartening that you don't stay with, with the people that, I mean, I remember John Wayne, you were a John Wayne fan, you watched every single John Wayne movie, you know, Humphrey Bogart, James D, you watched every movie, or same with the singers. That's how Frank Sinatra came on. He had a fan base that was unbelievable. And I thank all of you, really, truly, for what you were doing and to help, you know, his legacy and carrying it out. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Really, you deserve very good. There's one more thing we might want to have a little information from you from the inside. Uh, and it's about the politics of it. But, um, I think the question came from a person from Great Britain. And it would be is Albert. Great Britain. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Elvis used his right to vote in presidential elections? That's deep. <laughs> you know, um, Elvis really did not get involved with politics. He truly didn't. I mean, he, uh, I don't think he's ever voted. I, I don't know of a time that he's ever voted. I think that he was always for the person, I think, always was the person that voted for the person that he felt was the right person to do the job. Um, he would, he stayed out of politics. He felt that, you know, he was a performer. Um, and that he didn't want to, I think the closest he ever got to being political was in the ghetto. Yeah. Right? I think yeah, you can verify that. In the ghetto and maybe if I could dream. If I could dream, yeah. But more so in the ghetto. More so in the yeah. And, 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 um, because it touched on things that, that were close to him and he was concerned about. So, but as far as politics, uh, he left it up to the politicians. Um, and uh, unfortunately now, I think we, in our country, we have to be really a little bit more involved because the politicians aren't doing such a good job. So, and neither are they, not in Great Britain either. I think we're having a problem over there, right? <laughs> So yeah, so uh, that's, uh, they stayed away from the family. I mean, the family stayed away from politics. I don't think they've ever, ever voted. And, and, uh, and, and, and I think the other thing, too, is Vietnam. He was, he was concerned about us being over in Vietnam. Um, that was a very, uh, the movement of what was going on in the States at that time, with the hippies and, and um, what's his name? The, Uh, 
and the uh, yeah, Jimmy and Larry, he was really concerned about what was happening during that time. And, uh, young kids being on drugs and uh, fighting over in Vietnam. He was, with his group of people, definitely probably the most political he ever got was with his, with his inner circle and voice his opinion. But outside of that, no, he didn't vote. I don't want to advertise that in a big way because I do feel we need to vote. Thank you. I think we're going to come to soon end, unless Maria has one more question maybe from the audience. Of course I have. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's many left probably, but... Maybe last soon. Um, I have to take my glasses um, since I'm blind without them. Um, so, um, there's a question, uh, if there was um, an everyday life for you and Elvis at Raceland? And if yes, probably, or, or maybe you can let us know a bit about it. Okay, Maria, you're saying, was there an everyday life? Yes. Um, you know, he was pretty predictable in, the, in his daily life at Graceland, especially, especially because when he was up in California, it was different because he had a routine and he was doing a movie, he got up and, and um, it was that early, usually he'd come home around the same time, we'd have dinner, and he'd go over the back room and say his lines just a little bit and then ready for the next day. But at Graceland, it was, you know, it was, you know, our, it was, his and his son, you know, had a hard time sleeping, so our, our, our um, day started really around 4.30 in the afternoon. Around 5 o'clock we'd have breakfast. <laughs> and, um, and then just before Johnny Carson's monologue was over, or during the monologue, we would have dinner, actually. And sometimes dinner would be the same dinner every night. Um, if you like something, it would be every night. And I remember the first time that ever happened was when we were living in Los Angeles, and he had um, he had meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and string beans. And I would always bring it to him. The cook would cook it. I would bring him his dinner. And I thought, oh, this is really good. I had it. And then the second night, he asked for the same thing. I thought, wow, he really liked it. I'll have some more. <laughs> it's good too. And then this went on. Third night, fourth night, fifth night, sixth night, seventh. Back again in a week. I think it was a couple of weeks and he had the same thing every night. And when he had the same thing, that meant you had to have the same thing as well. <laughs> so you either liked it or if you didn't, you had to go somewhere else. But um, that was kind of, our schedule was really um, a lot going to the movies. We saw all the first runs because he knew the projection for a long time, we had to we rent the theater out, um, and we would sometimes watch one, most times two and three movies. Uh, and I was going to school uh, uh, in the beginning uh, when I would go, and I had to go to school at about eight o'clock. And sometimes we get home at six thirty in the morning, and I would go no sleep whatsoever. Um, and this went on until I graduated, and all the way. I mean, he uh, loved and loved movies. Um, had favorites, and sometimes he'd see his favorite movies over and over and over again. Um, he couldn't get enough of it. Monty Python the movie where he... Then he would act them out. And he would act them out, yeah. And he would know the lines. Um, and then we'd go horseback riding. He'd sometimes, you know, after, after breakfast, he'd have our, our uh, several person, my book writer, um, bring out the horses, and he'd put a show out in front of Graceland. Uh, we could take long drives, go to Two Blow. Uh, so it, it just varied, really. Everything kind of centered around what he wanted to do. And we did. And, and we'd go to motorcycle, or motorcycle riding. Uh, it was not your average day, obviously, but it's the things that he enjoyed go karting all around Grayson uh, driveway, racing. Um, Fairgrounds, rides, he went the fairgrounds. You know, he truly lived in a bubble. We we lived his world at Graceland. And really no one came in. It, it, rare if someone ever came in. And we couldn't introduce new people at all. I mean, he was secure with the people that he had picked. And he really didn't really want strangers. And you had to announce yourself whenever you came. And it was kind of an unspoken law that you didn't bring strangers in. It was unspoken that you did not bring a stranger into the house. 
Um, he didn't want anything out of the press. He wanted to live his life. He felt that when he was a bracelet behind the gates was his world. And he didn't want anyone criticizing that or telling him how he should live. He lived what he, how he wanted to live. So it was, um, it was quite an experience, uh, quite a learning curve, uh, and also an adjustment with different personalities. Um, and there were a few different personalities. Some didn't make it, some did, but you were put through the test. And it was a 24-7 job for the guys. I mean, uh, so it was a wild life, crazy life, good life. And this, it wasn't, I mean, we still, you know, there were some conflicts here and there, but you wouldn't expect that living so close and living every day with the same people, right? We worked together. We yeah. lived together. We played together. Everything. We got tired of each other from time to time. You know, it was, it, what we look back at now and realize, and we did it at the time, too, what a wonderful, fantastic life that he created for all of us. When you live it every day, it's kind of normal. Yeah, and you're not documenting anything. We weren't like they do today. Today, everything's documented. It's funny. I think he was the first in, in that as well. I mean, he, you know, he would never go for documenting his life or if it's private to him. That was his world, and he's already public and everything else. That's really what his bracelet was his sanctuary. That's where he felt the most comfortable and the most liberating uh, and didn't want anyone in his world. It didn't fit, that's for sure. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I think so, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's wow. such a pleasure. And thanks for sharing all these stories with us to get these insights. You know, because, you know, I've grown up too. I have to say to all of you, you know, it was a, a young girl growing up in a big world. I mean, truly a big, big world. There is, there's certainly an adjustment. You know, you, 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 you know, Elvis was a very strong individual, and he had likes and he had dislikes. It took me a while to understand it. As, you know. Meeting at 14, but living at Graceland at 17, and and I'm trying to accommodate, trying to figure it all out, the do's, the don'ts, and and adjusting. And you look, I look back now, and I think, you know, yes, I'll share things with you because I feel I can give them to have more. You can have a more understanding of what it's like for a man of his caliber and of his success and his fame. People think it's so in, so easy, but it wasn't. I mean, I was had a hard time adjusting on who he was, truly. And uh, he he went through all kind of phases. The phases that he went through, we went through. We lived every little thing with him. And um, that's why I think when Jerry and I are, because we were the youngest, I'm younger than you, by the way. <laughs> um, are so connected because we share the life that there aren't any more people around that that can went through what we went through and have lived really to tell the stories. You said we kind of grew up in Graceland. We grew up in Graceland. We grew up there for sure, and and uh, the experience that we shared was uh, I mean I value so much more than I ever did because you get to learn more. Now that I've, I've, I have shared some of my success, I mean, I'm sorry, I share some success as well. I'm going, how did he do it, really, with the fame that he had? Now I understand even so much more, so much more. And I tried, let me tell you, as a, as a, a young girl, I tried, because I, you know, I cared for him and loved him so much. I wanted everything perfect. and like he liked it. I mean, he, had, he was very strict and very tough on what he wanted and expected out of you, and you gave, could not give him less. Am I, am I right? And you were in a man's world. And I was in a man's tough. world, yeah. That was the other adjustment, and and uh, being a one woman living with about, what, eight, nine? Yeah. So that was in... Is it, yes. Some came, yeah, they came and went, but um, it was uh, like no other, and I can't compare it to anything else. I really can't. There isn't anyone to talk to. There isn't anyone to say, "Remember that time? Oh wow, that was that was a lot." 
kind of began to laugh, blah, blah, blah. He said, Jerry. <laughs> Still George. <laughs> anyway. So anyway, I'm sharing with you to give you a, a life behind the scenes and as much as I can in uh, I've come to terms with so many things. So thank you very much for having me. I truly appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have a great time.